Oh, it's so good to be back as the church. I love that our church, at the five-minute break, that I have to wrestle you back to your chairs. I love that you love one another. I love the conversations, the fellowship that happens in these little moments. And these aren't throwaway moments. I want you to know this is not just a pragmatic time where it's kind of helpful to you know, give a break to get the kids in. These little moments of fellowship can change lives. These little moments where we get to minister one another and just, and just laugh together about how pitiful the Cowboys are this year and console one another or whatever it is, these are wonderful little moments of ministry where you can bless somebody else and where you can receive encouragement from others. So thank you for loving one another as the church. Well, it's my joy this morning to introduce to you, uh, he's not a stranger to this church, but to reintroduce to you my friend Bob Odom. Bob Odom has faithfully pastored LifeGate Church of Seguin for 37 years. Now, after 37 years, he is preparing another man. He's preparing another man to transfer the gospel to him, to the next generation. Another man who he is preparing to take over the primary pastoral leadership of the church that Bob and his wife Cindy started in 1980. Bob, this week we heard a, a message from our own John Payne about gospel transferring, about, as, as Ricky just reminded us, commending, one generation commending God's works to the next. And Bob is a living example of this. Bob, what a legacy you are creating. What a heritage we have as a result of men like you, your faithfulness. What I'm most excited about in hearing Bob preach is that every encounter I have with Bob, whether he's preaching or whether he's just putting his arm around me and encouraging me in some way, is that I always leave with a sense of our almighty God. I always come away from my interactions with Bob encouraged, equipped, edified, and freshly grateful for men like you. So Bob, please come now. Herald God's word to us. And as he comes, please, let's welcome our friend Bob. Well, thank you for allowing me to come. I appreciate the invitation from John and Aaron. I just uh, always benefit from every contact with these guys and I'm so grateful for what God is doing here in your church. I also got to see Bart. Uh, I'd only met Bart by Skype, and when I met him in person, I leaned over and asked the person next to me. I thought she had to be at least 18 to go to the pastor's college, and uh, I asked him how old he was, and he said, well, I'm 35. And then I thought, well, do they let liars go to the pastor's college? <laughs> I can't be 35. But I guess uh, I looked like I'm 68 to him. I don't know what... And he was right. But um, now I just appreciate your church and your pastoral staff. And, and do you know who else I appreciate? I, I want to say this. Uh, the older I get and the longer I'm in pastoral ministry of any kind, the more I appreciate the Barnabases. You know, Barnabas, the very name, means son of encouragement. And from the time I walked in the doors, welcomed by some just wonderful people and made me feel so welcome. Thank you for that. And, and just uh, uh, everybody that's just doing their part. And, and it seems like every time I, I go to a, a Sovereign Grace meeting, Don, Don and Nita are, are there serving somebody and uh, just for years. And so just, I know there are people over in the nursery or whatever you call it now, and uh, that, that there's other names for those. I don't know what you call it. But anyway, where your children are. But I know there are people serving. And Barnabases, and I just become more and more aware through the years that I couldn't do what I do if I had not been surrounded by Barnabases. So thanks if you're a Barnabas, a son of encouragement. You're, you're one of the ones that's working and making it all work. Uh, just so appreciate that and very grateful. And if I had a bag of medals, I would hand one to every mother and dad of young children. You know, you've got them running around all over the place, and we do too. And I am so glad that the first church I ever, no, the second church I ever pastored, the youngest 
attendee, regular attendee, was 60. And I was in my 20s. And I thought, so this is what my life's going to look like. <laughs> and I love the 60-year-olds, but you know, you'd like to see, have, hear a little noise once in a while and, and have some kids running around and trip you in the aisle. But just uh, so grateful for just uh, young families. Thank you to every mother, every mom who's wrestling. If you've been sitting there today wrestling with a child, thanks for doing that. And, and I, hope, I hope that uh, that day will come when you look back on these wrestling years and you realize, man, this, is, this has been a good thing. I have two girls that we wrestled with too, and they're 38 and 36 now. I have five grandchildren, and they're all at the wrestle stage. And uh, we just are, are so thankful for every stage and every season of life. And I uh, hope that, that you will just remember to enjoy the wrestling matches because the day will come soon enough when it's not like that. And, and uh, you'll, you'll be grateful for that too. <laughs> but, but to look back, it's just such a, a great time. I wish I had some medals to pin on every young mom and every young dad here today. I have very much enjoyed through the years studying from time to time the different songs that are in the scriptures. I love music. I like to sing. I don't do it real well. I'm not, I'm not going to sing, so don't worry. But I love music, and I love singing, and it seems like um, there's a lot of that in the scriptures. I think it was Bernard Ram, the Bible scholar, that said Christianity is the singingest of all religions. Well, we've got something to sing about. And the scriptures tell us this. They, they focus our attention so much on who it is we sing to and why we're singing. And one of the things I love about reading through the Revelation is the number of glimpses that we get into heaven, and we see what's going on there. And often, it is singing. It's worship. The attention is on the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I've enjoyed those kind of studies through the year and years, and I want to read today one of those glimpses, one of those songs, one of those occasions when we get to see what, what uh, is actually going on. Not just so that we can know what heaven is like, but so that we can know what life is like right now and that will go on for eternity. That this can be helpful. If you grab hold and hang on and listen to what's going on in Revelation 5, great scene of heaven. Revelation 5. <clears throat> Use your imagination. Did, did you show up with your imagination today? Yes. Are the kids among us? Uh, plug in your imagination. Forget the fact that there's a white-haired guy standing up here. Kids, young people, plug in your imagination and picture yourself being present when this was going on. Listen to this. Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy, worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll and to look into it. And I began to weep loudly. This is John writing this. I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth." 
Then I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. I recently came across a story about a traveler, a man that was going to different countries and he was passing through a European country and, and he saw a, a civic building and he thought something was odd about it because as he walked down the sidewalk, he looked up and on this uh, government building, there was a, a lamb that had been plastered in about two-thirds of the way up, a spire on that building, way up in the air. And he thought, well, that's odd. I mean, it's not like this is a church or something like that. I don't know what, he didn't know what it was, but a government building thought, that's odd. He went and asked questions. And so he asked, why uh, was a lamb plastered so high up on this, on this spire. And he was told the story that years before, many years before, when the building was being built, there was a brick and stone mason that was up on a scaffold way up in the air um, helping to build this building. And that stone mason lost his balance and fell to certain death. But as he fell, a guy was going, taking five, I think it was, sheep to market walking right next to that building, and the stonemason fell on top of that sheep, killing the sheep. But his life was spared, and he recovered. And so he asked if there could be, if he could, as an expression of his gratitude, plaster this lamb up there, a sheep up on this building as a memorial just for his gratitude for his life being spared. And he was allowed to do that. And so for generations... There were people walking by saying, why this? And it was told because the lamb broke the fall of this man. And in some sense, in a much greater sense, this just serves as a small example of what was going on in this heavenly scene where the lamb of God has, is being seen and focused on and worshipped because of his extraordinary work. Now, what I hope that we can see today, kind of a main idea, I hope that we can see today that, that this extraordinary work of God through the Lamb of God, His Son, leads us to many things. And not only leads us, but compels us to worship, compels us to mission, compels us to discipleship. And all of that we see clearly in Revelation 5. First of all, let's look at the scene. Here we are. Now, here's your imagination. You're still with me. You plugged in your imagination. Think of this for a minute, the scene. You picture heaven. The Father is on the throne, and in His hand is a scroll, and in the, that scroll is sealed with seven seals. He's holding the scroll. The, the throne is surrounded by all kinds of creatures and folks, 24 elders, doing what elders, by the way, ought to do best. Fall down on their face before God. <laughs> Cast their crowns before Him. I'm an elder. That's what I need to be doing. Throw, cast my crown before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And these elders are just doing that. Every time you see these 24 elders in a scene from heaven, they're just falling on their faces. <laughs> and here they are doing that. And then there are four living creatures that had been, they'd been described a little bit back in the fourth chapter where it says, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings and full of eyes all around and within, day and night, never cease saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. They're always drawing attention to the Lord, these four living creatures, whatever they were. And the elders were there and the myriads, it says thousands upon thousands. You know how many a thousand times a thousand is? How many is a thousand times a thousand? A million. And there are thousands upon thousands of these myriads of angels surrounding the throne and focusing once again on the Lamb of God and the Father who's sitting on that throne holding that scroll. And you get that picture and then we're told that everything, creatures and people in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea are all crying out praise and honor and adoration to that Father. 
And he's holding that scroll and looking for, is there one, and the question is asked, is there one worthy enough to open the scroll so that we can see what proclamation of God, what revelation of God is enclosed in that scroll? And they couldn't find anybody worthy. So much so that we're told that John started weeping as he saw this vision. He was looking and realizing that, that scroll's not going to get opened. There are seven seals on it. We're not knowing what's inside there. We're not ever going to know because there's no one worthy to open it. Now, when I read this the first time, I just, uh, just think with me for a minute. No one is worthy? How about Mary, the mother of Jesus? Not worthy. How about Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel, prophets of God? Not worthy. John the Baptist, surely. No. Not found worthy. Okay, I got it. Elijah and Enoch. Those guys didn't die in normal ways. Surely. No, they're not worthy. No one was found to be worthy. Well, what about the 24 elders laying on their faces? Not worthy. How about those four living creatures? Not worthy. So John wept because he thought whatever God wants to say to us in that scroll we're not ever going to hear it and then someone comes and says wait a minute wait a minute there's the Lamb of God the Lion of the tribe of Judah Jesus he's worthy to open that scroll Jesus a lamb it's kind of meek <laughs> A lion, that's not so meek. He's described in those ways. He's rooted back in prophecy when he says, the one that came from the root of the tribe of Jesse, David. Isaiah 11. The one who conquers by sacrificing. <laughs> kind of unorthodox. The one who leads by serving. Not what we normally would think. He's the one who's found worthy. And you know what he does? He pick, <laughs> you imagine? Walks up to the Father on the throne and takes the scroll out of the Father's hand. And then the seals begin to be broken because someone worthy is found to open that scroll. Now the next, we, we won't <clears throat> get into this obviously, but chapter 6 and 7 and 8 in the Revelation tell what was revealed in that scroll, the proclamations of God. Just for example, in the, when the first seal was opened and part of that scroll was understood, there was a white horse with a conqueror there. The second seal was opened and there's a red, red horse with a rider and a sword and peace was taken away from the earth. There were other riders. Sometimes the economy of the earth was upset. Sometimes one, one, as much as one-fourth of the earth died. There were things revealed that were going on there. Um, there, there was even a, a half hour of silence that's proclaimed there. Lots of things revealed in chapter 6, 7, and 8. Trumpets were sounded. All kinds of things happened. But you know, one of the things that I've thought about in reading this and in reading through the Revelation through the years, I, I've thought this, that it always seems like what is revealed is a lot less important than who is revealed. Because when you read this scene, What's the, it, the fact that the scroll gets opened is wonderful, but the only reason it got opened is because there was one worthy to open it. And so all the attention is to him. So the elders are falling down. The creatures are falling down. The angels, myriads of them, are singing and praising. Why? Because there's one worthy to open that scroll. And not a whole lot is made of what's in the scroll. There's some made uh, in those chapters. But the main attention is to the one who was able to open it. I guess that's some way why it says the revelation is this, the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's who's revealed. There are things and events revealed too. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. Yeah, the events are going to be revealed. But the person is being revealed. The worthy Lamb of God. Now why such celebration? Why such singing? Why so much made of this Lamb of God, Lion of, of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse? Why is so much made of him? 
Why such celebration? Well, <clears throat> the fact is this, I believe. The lamb must be worshipped. Now, <clears throat> I want to, let me tell you something. <laughs> when we were looking for, one of, the, one of the things I appreciate about Sovereign Grace is worship leaders. Did you know that? And, and here's one reason. When we were looking for a place to fit in the body of Christ, we, we looked for 15 years for a place. Where can we possibly fit? We're not charismatic enough to, for the charismatics to like us. We're not, we're, we're too reformed for anybody to like us. And just, it's, uh, you know, just, we were a mess. We, a casserole, of all, I don't know. We never found a place to fit. But one of the reasons is worship as well. And I remember that Jacob Lee and I, now serving in Africa, we, we drove to Columbus, Ohio, and we were a part of a, of a church gathering there looking, maybe this is the place where LifeGate can plug in and fit and be accountable. And we went to a worship service, and, I, and I, I, we were not led in worship. We were driven in worship. We, we had, they had worship drivers, but not worship leaders. And I realized you know, that's, I love worship that's compelling, but it's compelling because of who the worship is centered on. Not compelling because somebody's standing behind the flock with a whip, driving you across the road. You know, I, I, didn't, I don't like to be driven somewhere, do you? But I like to be compelled. And there is something about that, and that's something we, we really have found so much in Sovereign Grace. I, I just, I love that. Compelled to worship. That's what's going on in Revelation 5. These people and these creatures and whoever all is described, they are compelled to worship. It's not a requirement. It's like, who set it up here? That's not because we get paid for it. I guess nobody gets paid. No worship. No, nobody ever gets paid at LifeGate. <laughs> we kind of hope pastors get paid once in a while, but then you don't get paid to play the instruments. But the reason, the motivation is not money, it's not attention. It's because we're compelled by the presence of the Lamb. You know, this is something that I've so appreciated too and that I think comes out of this text so much. It says that they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. Every time, I'm, I'm a student of history, especially revival history, when God has poured out His Spirit in such magnificent ways in history on certain people and certain nations and certain groups. And it seems like almost without fail, when you study those revivals, there is a new hymnody that comes out of that. There's new music. There's something fresh being birthed in the Spirit, and so there's new music. I love to say this in our congregation because uh, it's easy to think what I'd rather sing is just what I'm more familiar with. Now, I'm, I'm 68 years old. I'm really familiar with old stuff. But I, one of the things that thrills me is that when there's a fresh move of God, there's fresh music coming. Why? Because it's, a, it's an expression of a fresh worship, a fresh experience with God. And you could read through all through the Psalms. It just says it over and over and over again. A new song was being sung. There were, there's something new happening in hearts and being expressed by the way that they express their worship in music. A new song was going on. Now, one of the things that I love about church is you've got multi-generational uh, one of the things I loved about the pastor's conference, we started the conference with crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne, an old hymn. <laughs> and then followed it up with a lot newer music and interspersed throughout for every generation. There's a place to plug in and there's a place we know that. And I just, I love that. I love that because the church is multi-generational. There are songs that were so special to me as I came in, into faith in the Lord. And there are songs that are so good to you, but we look at them, we say, what, are the, what do these lyrics tell us? What does this music tell us? And there's a new song. There's something that's a reflection of, of a fresh work of God. Whether it's an older song or a newer song, those blend together, and there's worship that goes, that's going on there. We see it right here in heaven. The worthiness of Jesus is being proclaimed with just new songs, fresh experience of God. 
the thing that is, his worthiness is described as in this way, very specifically. He's got power, wealth, resources, wisdom because of his application of knowledge, strength, might, honor, glory, blessing. All of these things, the Lamb is being exalted and honored. And what's the basis of that worthiness? Remember, he's so worthy he could open the scroll. What's the basis of that worthiness? Well, we're told this. He was slain. And he ransomed people for God and brought those people together to be his kingdom and to be priests. So they're singing. Praise is spoken. 24 elders doing what they do, dropping the crowns, falling down on their face before the Lamb of God. Four creatures falling down, myriads of angels singing because the Lamb is worthy. So what? <laughs> you know what? I, I love to ask that question of anybody who's preaching. So what? That's cool. I love that. You know, it's a cool thing to see this glimpse we have of heaven. We know that that's going on. But what does that mean right now in my life? Well, what it means is this in part. It means for us what it meant for them. There must be a response to Jesus. There must be a response that is worship, that is a lifestyle that reflects the work and the glory of God. My life has been affected, therefore my life will look like it's been affected by the very presence of God. I'll go to work a different person. I'll relate to my wife in a new way. I'll relate to my children in a new way. I'll see marriage and parenting and friendship and discipleship and vocation. I will see life in a very different way because my life has been affected and changed. That's all worship. It's more than just raising our voices. It's living our lives. The worthiness of the Savior is just, it's just in your face. There must be a response. I was a student at Asbury College in 1970 when God poured out His Spirit on that campus and I will never forget this as long as I live. I walked into Hughes Auditorium. I had been in Hughes Auditorium hundreds of times because we had three weekly chapels there. We had other meetings there. I was in the chapel a lot. But when God poured out His Spirit, I walked into that chapel and something very different was happening. God was there in a new and fresh way. And the one thing that came to my mind. Cindy and I walked in the door and we, we had heard that God was pouring out His Spirit and we, we walked in the door and the only thing I could think of was it is irreverent to stand up. The presence of God was so thick. It must have been like, like when the cloud filled the temple and the priest couldn't even minister. All I knew was I need to get on my knees or my face as soon as possible. God was there. There was something just compelling about that. I think that's what Revelation 5 is about on a much more magnificent scale. Jesus, the worthy Lamb of God. And there's something there that makes us need to bow before Him and participate. Join our voice with the chorus. Join our lives reflecting the glory of God. Another part of that, we're told in this text that he made these people, he took these people who were so amazed at his worthiness and his presence, he took them and said, you're a kingdom and you're priests. Well, we're part of a kingdom. You and I, I mean, you and I. This is not just dead people. <laughs> this is us. We're part of the kingdom of God. We're priests. What does that mean, though? It means that our life, there's something compelling us not only to worship and beyond our words and beyond the sanctuary and beyond even the prayer closet. There's to be a living out of our lives in a way that wants to share that that we've seen. We've seen something that amazed us when we stood in the presence of God. When we, were, when we gave our life to Christ, it happened for me when I was 16. When I gave my life to Christ and I was confronted with the Lord Jesus Christ, I knew that that wasn't just a, 
a random event in my history, but God was requiring something of me in the sense of compelling me. He showed me something that now I must share. And I began to grow and to understand what does it mean to be part of that kingdom? What does it mean to be a priest in that kingdom? I read a story years, about many years ago when a man by the name of Charles Peace was being led in England to the scaffold where he was to be hanged for crimes. And a chaplain walked along with him and asked him this question. Charles Peace was an atheist. But he asked him this question, would you like the consolations of religion? And it seemed it was a common question when someone was going to be killed. And Charles Peace, the atheist, it's recorded, said this to the chaplain, do you believe it? And then he said, if I believed that, I would crawl across England on broken glass to tell men that it was true. In some way, that kind of captures the spirit of what's going on in Revelation 5. Compelling worship, but worship that makes us the kingdom and that makes us priests. We just have to not only be enthralled with who it is we're worshiping, but so much so that we want to disciple others and we want to be on mission. It's going to affect our lives. There's something that's not, we're not being driven to it with a whip. <laughs> We're being compelled by a presence. We're being compelled by God's Spirit. Worship just must occur. Sharing must occur. Mission, discipleship must occur. And what we find is that that Lamb of God and that Lion of the tribe of Judah and that Root of, the, uh, of Jesse, Jesus, as we focus our attention and lose ourselves in Him, we begin to focus on this mission and this calling and this discipleship and this worship and we begin to be aware of our inability in so many respects. But do you know what I've, I've, I am growing to appreciate increasingly about walking with God is that He helps us in those areas that are so hard for us. Do you know that I'm, I'm really an introvert. You could ask Everett. He's been, I've, been, I've been around Everett since he was born. But... Yeah, I'm an introvert. Called to be a preacher. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Just a quiet guy in the corner, you know. And, and, but some of that, I've known, has been fear of man. Some of it has just been timidity. And what I find the Spirit of God doing is overcoming those things that are my deficiencies and my weaknesses and my tendencies and helping me to see there's something compelling here that needs to be shared. And so those things, I, I would imagine in a room this big, there are lots of people who feel pretty inadequate. Can I witness to anybody? <laughs> Is anybody going to listen to me anyway? Aren't they just going to scoff, laugh, think I'm nuts? All the fruit is up to the Lord. But the compelling thing about God, when our attention is on Him and we're in love with Him and we're focused on that Lamb, we're going to respond. And whatever deficiencies we come with, the Lord begins to work on those. Fear of man, timidity, just feeling inadequate. Who doesn't feel that? And those who never feel that, I wonder, <laughs> maybe you should. Well, we should feel a little inadequate. We just feel, I'm adequate for this. Here I go. Uh, well, you know, the Lord is able to take us. Every one of us. Every person. The youngest here and the oldest here. The Lord is able to work on these inadequacies and weaknesses and sins and other kinds of things that we have so that we may join that compelling witness that's going on in heaven right now. And we join their voices we join their worship. We join the understanding of mission, discipleship, because we see who it is that produces all of that. Let's pray.
Heavenly Father, would you forgive us, Lord, when we so often tend to be overwhelmed by everything else and not overwhelmed by your presence. Lord, would you help us to be able today to join in even for these few moments, Lord, may we just be joined together with those creatures and elders and angels of heaven surrounding your throne, focusing on the worthiness of the Lamb who was slain. Lord, let us today be more overwhelmed with Jesus than we are overwhelmed with our life circumstances or our fears and inadequacies. Lord, let us see clearly today so that we might be moved in your direction, Lord, to be your people on mission in your kingdom, priest in your kingdom, discipling, sharing, worshiping, praying, having our lives, Lord, caught up in your hands and having our lives, Lord, thrust out from you with that compelling presence of Jesus Christ, your Holy Spirit drawing us. We pray it in his name. Amen.